No, it's not snowing on Alan in August. I've decided to give previously overlooked imagery of Alan a chance to educate and inform, probably more the latter. You will need to put to one side expectations for the serene literary grandeur you are accustomed to in my voiceovers, natural segues and neat circular referencing. No, this one will be more of the brutalist variety. I've put the clips and photographs in an order that roughly makes sense. Disclaimer over with, onward. Rewind three years, and my team in the market for an expedition lifeboat originally comprised three, plus all manner of advisors and supporters. Eagle-eyed lifeboat watchers will notice this isn't the inside of Alan. It's in fact Alan's Chinese cousin sat to his starboard side, this one here in fact. We opted to go for Alan in the middle. Whilst less shiny and a few years older, we were encouraged by the Norwegian outfitting and it broadly turned out to be as impressive as expected. We were originally led to believe that the whole layup was Scandinavian too, but that shells may in fact be Singaporean. That one's built Norway right. by a company called Normar. I don't know if they're still on the go or they'll be bought over or what. This happens quite a lot. Normar, the brand, is depending on how your Google search goes, is and isn't Norwegian. Anyhow, both appear to be well regarded by North Sea rig operators and they didn't cut corners with the fiberglass layup. Here are some of Alan's smaller and newer brothers and sisters from the Far East. With a capacity of 68 people, seating was always going to be Alan's priority from the early days. On each black splodge, a passenger's backside would reside, plus a harness and headrest for each. The driving console is broadly still as it was, but I've moved the compass and on-off panel and removed the retro light switches. I myself in with my driving seat. It's a lot, lot bigger inside than I imagined. I was a little bit concerned that the seven and a half metre boats might be a little bit uh, titchy, but I'm actually quite impressed by the... Uh, this one is Chinese built yeah. and fitted out in UK. This is back inside the Chinese built lifeboat, and I confess we were still partly swayed by its smart outward condition, but on closer inspection the layout was more cramped, it contained modules we did not need, and the engine was lower rated. Alan the dealer was keen for us to take it. My supposition being that it's harder to sell the pricier near new boats that aren't going to be totally gutted and outfitted as liverboard houseboats. But with his understated authority, our expert guest, who you'll recognise from the recent exhaust pipe investigation episode, kept nudging me back towards the Normar. And thank God for that. Experience and wisdom vindicated many times over since. But you can't blame the dealer for the sales strategy. Yeah, yeah. It's a very different design, actually. Very different. A bit more spacious, isn't it? Without the, without the floor in here. Yeah, because the, 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 the sort of the uh, the seat the driver's module is very different in this yeah. one. Yeah. Does the heater run off 12 volts or is that off? It's no, a 42. 42. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. Right. And generally, do people have the cheaper ones for houseboats if they don't yeah. want any of the? the, the yeah, the, because the, they're they're yeah. basic strip out. I was going to ask about this one. You said it's been used. Do you know what, what it was used for? Just the same. Just a, a yeah. rig light, but. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it hasn't been used by third parties to. Do trips or no, like no, that. no, 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 yeah. no, no. I yeah. buy them direct from the oil companies. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. We finally managed to get Alan on board Alan and persuaded him to talk us through his history and any idiosyncrasies. Boom comes up. A bit of gear. It, yeah. it, it, allow, it allows it to expand sure. and, and not because yeah. it, it could burst us. The pressure, I've seen it happen yeah. on, on boats. Oh, you're expanding foam is serious. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah. And this floor is solid, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's a release lever on the outside of the boat to have a fender, right. which when it's get, being lowered, so it doesn't bump off the side of the, the ship or the rig, mm. and that lever, you pull that, you can see it on the outside, and that moves a pin and releases the... It's mostly insulated, some lifeboats weren't at all, although later excavations gave me a bit of a wobble in terms of lauding that particular area of workmanship, loose factory rubble and even cigarette butts casually chucked into the void. The lifeboat needed a survey from all sides and angles, and we also got a good look at the third boat in this particular row. The rest of the boats in the yard were sold and having work done to them before being freighted out. Whilst I'm sure an excellent and indeed spacious future houseboat, its condition scared us off. Two metres longer, and with the same personnel capacity as our choice, Alan it would be. The changes have been so gradual, but these pre-sale images really contrast to today. Bleach gel coat, 
safety grab loops, no railings, the davit assemblies bow and stern, orange underside, 48 volt hookup cable, a fine looking vessel in his honest unsullied state. After the 600 mile road journey down to our boatyard, our first job was to rip out all the unnecessary internal mouldings, old electrics and assorted freebies included with this previously in-service Solas lifeboat. On the deck, behold, the stainless steel sprinkler distribution box and piping, the boat's code name with reflectors for rescue helicopters and a few basic vents. Inside was of course where the majority of initial work took place. There was hundreds of kilos of fiberglass seating and cowling, stainless handholds and endless slightly manky looking harnesses. Long hours by my team totally transformed the interior and we could get a real sense of what Alan's interior might offer us. Seven and a half meters or 25 foot ish is no giant craft but the bulbous interior gives you more than you'd expect even if the insulation limits potential headroom. In front of that old very square and not very stainless steel fuel tank we can home in on those giant long round things. In an emergency these air tanks maintain positive pressure and an atmosphere you can breathe in a sealed lifeboat. We do not need them. It fell to my friend James to uninstall them and first he needed to release the pressure. And we've also got some very exciting oxygen bottles kicking around. Uh, so that's for when it's all used in the emergency and all the hatches are all done up. Uh, it's time to open the air tanks. Uh, just thought I'd show you as it is uh, amusingly and distressingly loud. After that excitement, the near 60 kilo a piece tank somehow ended up outside of Allen and then over to me to dispose of them. Despite ringing ahead to two scrap dealers, on arrival they rejected them on the basis of some mealy mouth regulation nonsense. So I ended up driving around most of Essex in East London with these tanks in the back of a hire car, which apparently broke some other obscure rules, and eventually I found a scrapyard with common sense and a can-do attitude. They just asked that I drill the tanks first to prove that they held no residual pressure. Excellent. And a few quid in the bank from the scrap steel. The extra space that resulted was nothing short of spectacular, and it was the only time I've ever been able to stand upright in the middle or bow end of Allen without sticking my head out the bow hatch. I cut the glassed in embedded steel strips out from the hull with a metal cutting jigsaw blade. It took nearly an hour. I did not yet own an angle grinder. Shocking, I know. I now use mine to open parcels. So forward to that 200 litre steel fuel tank, still fueled up from god knows when, and as far as I can tell with only the engine's own fuel filter in between it and the injectors. No water separator or pre-filter to remove coarse interlopers or unwanted guests. This needed emptying. The diesel most certainly didn't get passed through a filter and then into my friend's vehicle's fuel tank. With this charming cast iron hand pump, the large hole in the bottom of Allen, where the water intake and diaphragm used to be that pumped up seawater for the sprinkler system, came in useful as a route out of the boat. I later decided against glassing in that gaping hole as it was enormous, and we were up against the clock, so I had two large plates of stainless steel cut to size, a serious pair of silicon gaskets likewise, and bolted it closed. The tank was no more than scrap steel, so awaited removal, and only just fitted out of the hatch, thankfully avoiding the need for a prolonged inside angle grinding job. The three rigid copper lines, the supply, the return and the breather, came out nicely and again, all the old copper went for scrap. Escaping from Alan's belly for a moment, the team and I asked some experienced friends over for an initial appraisal and to help build a works list, and longtime photographer and designer friend Dan came along to take some stills images. This was really a transfer of basic wisdom from marine engineers, small boat skippers and those in general who, unlike me, aren't engaging in the small boat world as a means to access very remote ocean pack ice. A sailor I am not, save for a clutch of childhood dinghy sailing and powerboat certificates. Our first major task was to remove one of the lateral glass fibre walkways. We needed to set a structure lower down and at a length that spanned the two low zones previously occupied by the fuel tank and the air cylinders. Any structural rigidity this once provided will be more than matched by steel box section to come. But first, what would be useful would be to give ourselves a flat working surface instead of an unevenly shaped concave bilge. In fact, my plan was to eliminate this part of the bilge, leaving one at the bow and one at the stern, no longer linked with pipes. In hindsight, given the additional time I now have, I'd have packed this with lead or steel. I've packed a little of the latter into a small section, as detailed in an episode. 
We leveled support battens, put down marine grade ply, and then whacked down some waterproof lino. The hole, when the hole closed up, but pure... Yeah. As it happened, this small zone is now packed with marine grade two part foam to exclude water. This false floor became a basis for a key part of what would follow for Alan. But Alan had hidden depths, or a litany of expired bric a brac, depending on which way you want to view it. All sorts of authentic, original accessories from the lifeboat days. What is in here? Well, it's water. Emergency drinking water in very large quantities. I thought this seat was a bit heavy. It's full of a lot of these and a lot more where that came from. Uh, very tasty. We've got some nutritional information on the side here. Uh... Around the driving console, originally Alan had been outfitted with all sorts. A hookup battery charger which would have linked to either an oil rig or a ship, a vertical conduit and footrest setup that would not be any use to us, and a comically hopeless searchlight. Quite why even in 2007 people didn't exceed Solar specifications and install LED lighting confuses me. To the engine. The original engine cowling also doubled as yet more seating, but there was only a small access hatch to the bay itself. This is totally inadequate for Alan in a more committed expedition and sea passage role. Off it came, and at that stage I had a book specialist mechanic come in to teach us about the engine and to do a deep dive. Valve clearances, new head gasket and so on. The outcome was an even better behaved engine. I'd not done any other work yet, like rubbing back and painting surface rust, or replacing the starter motor or alternator, but the propeller turned in circles when requested to do so, and we saw that it was good. Here are some of the more sorry looking accoutrements to the engine, each with their days numbered. The alternator never worked, and was visibly corroded, and the starter motor was okay initially before the solenoid popped. An easy fix in my father's workshop, and it's now our backup. These components offer us a segue to electrics. And yes, I know this is a turbocharger and not electrics. It's actually separated from the engine at the moment for a refurb whilst the exhaust is also off. Electrics then. We'd be starting from scratch as all the ship or rig hookup and 12 volt batteries were consigned to history. I'd be designing a far more elaborate 24 volt system. I did most of the basics at home, sat staring at example schematics online, researching everything that confused me and then sketching my own plan and laying out components. Before long, the various pieces of electric string and studs and fuses and switches ended up in something of a system within a frame. The board itself is robust polyethylene, safe plus easy to drill for mounting. I can use both sides, the front for accessible switches and meters and the rear where all the complex gubbins resided. This is not a word of a lie, the first time I rigged up the low power circuit up to the old tired pair of batteries from Allen, there was no giant explosion nor shower of sparks. Instead, one of the floodlights obediently switched on. This was encouraging. I mounted the box to an upright brace, along with the flat rubber bush against the bracket to try and limit vibrations from the engine shaking the thing around and nuts loose. It's grown busier over the months, but actually less complicated as times passed, since I've routed cables more neatly and collected together some negative lines, either at 12 or 24 volts, onto one wider gauge wire. It gives a clearer picture and less spaghetti for anyone else needing to work on the system. Our time and the opening salvo of my now long held fondness for drilling holes through pieces of thick steel was thereafter and seemingly ever more committed to the racking. That glorious empty space within the mid and bow section of the interior was short lived as my team needed racking for general stowage but more importantly five enormous collapsible diesel bladders to give Alan range and the ability to get home again if something went wrong. It's a basic bolted together galvanized box section affair. Why bolted and not welded? So we could put it all together cheaply and so we could also take it apart easily or alter it if needed. And we couldn't weld, especially indoors. This really did take a lot of time. James and I spent hours marking, drilling and bolting. 
We tightened the stainless bolts slowly so they didn't gall with the friction of high speed turning. In fact, it took so long that I regularly bedded down for the night so as to get an early start the next day. It turns out that Alan's engine is an excellent iPad stand. Making square boxy things became somewhat ingrained in my psyche, and I made the engine cowling too. It was dramatically smaller than the original, so giving us more cabin space. Construction was basic timber and board, treated for rot, and then coated in a thin layer of epoxy resin to waterproof. Finally, I skinned it with fiberglass. Skinning things in fiberglass caught on too, and the battery box, again of basic board design, didn't escape the treatment. I say skinning, as it merely provides a stiff, waterproof, wipe clean outer surface. The skin won't offer much in terms of strength. I've decided for reasons of effortless narrative flow to forego chronological accuracy here, so you'll notice that for these next photos and clips, Alan's interior is rather spacious once again. No racking or engine cowling. Alan needed a float test. I called it sea trials in the initial episode back in the heady days of 10,000 video views per hour, not per day. Goodness knows why the YouTube gods have forsaken us, hopefully only temporarily. But I digress. It wasn't sea trials. We just wanted to make sure Alan floated, moved, and steered. A chilly November morning, and again with some friends and supporters. This was so early on that our registration number was printed on a sheet of paper and duct taped to the side of the hull. We planned a brief out and back loop into the estuary, got some footage whilst realising how poor the inbuilt video stabilisation is in Sony mirrorless cameras, had a play to see what the turning circle was like, and then turned tail for home. Dan, my photographer friend who you will have seen in a couple of the other videos, was again on board. We dropped him off so he could get some more images from the banks as the early winter light added some atmosphere. Anyhow, it was an expensive but important day. It gave me confidence to commit to Alan and know that we'd not bought a lemon. Safely back on his cradle, we were at that time filming the early stages of a documentary for the Arctic project that the Covid debacle put an end to. I can't use footage from that doc as I don't own the rights, and I can only use fair dealing as an excuse if I critique or review it in some kind. So, here goes. For film geeks, our director opted to shoot on 16mm film, and it's so sad that for now, the bulk of that hard work won't see the light of day. Regardless, here's some production footage of me pressure washing the deck. Really it was to capture the dramatic footage of the sunset shot through spraying water in the vague context of Alan's restoration. All that showering and sprucing up readied Alan for work on the bleached orange gel coat covering his entire outer shell. Our plan was to restore the existing gel coat, to save time and money. It wasn't just a cosmetic job, as a very bleached gel coat may eventually allow the fiberglass itself to degrade in the sun and in the wet. We started off with a heavy oxidation remover, and then a going over with a restorative wax treatment. Whilst not blemish free, it was a satisfying end result. Alas, within a few months the chalky bleaching returned, and it seeded my decision to sand back and paint Alan the next spring. The outdoor 24 volt floodlights and the four cameras, installed but not yet plumbed in permanently, went in long before I started filming for this channel, so that's why you've never seen the installation. I've retreated on some of the cable conduit decisions from those time pressured days, but here was the full HD feed from a quick test of the bow camera. And to finish, proof that the floodlights, that draw barely a couple of amps each, work rather pleasingly. One new thing for you before I go. I retrieved this fibreglass board from 18 months laid in the sun and the coastal elements. I wanted to see how various sealants fared for external use. All three have pulled through fine, without perishing by going brittle or dry and dusty. The bond is still strong and they remain waxy. The brands and details are in the description. The coming months are going to be very expensive for Alan and I, with lots of electrics, nav and comms, and the unexpected exhaust and turbo refurbishment. So, if Alan's army can mobilise via the medium of membership, merchandise and books, that will set us up for overdue and thoroughly deserved global success and unmitigated glory. Bye.